we are doing this series called Revive, and one of the things, one of the main drum beats, one of the main lines I've been telling you for at least the last three weeks is simply this, that when God does a reviving work in your life, it calls for a response, okay? We've been working on that for the last two or three weeks. That when you've been praying and God begins to do things in your life and He begins to work on some things, some areas in your life, whatever it may be, when He does that, He's not just doing that to be busy. And so when He begins a work, it requires, it calls for a response from us. But now I want to give you another line. I'm going to close this series out next week. Uh, and giving you seven principles of revive that you can carry with you. If you can't remember all these seven or eight weeks that we preached and talked about it, you'll have, the, you'll have a summary. You'll have Cliff Notes version uh, of it. And, uh, but here's the next line <clears throat> that I want you and I to be aware of today, okay? And that is this, for His reviving work to be accomplished in us, It has to be a continual work, okay? For God's work to be accomplished in you and I, it's not a one-time thing. It's a continual process that God is doing. Now, you know what that means? That means, remember what I started this whole thing out with, when God does a reviving work, it calls for a response. So if His reviving work is continual, then our response has to be continual. <clears throat> Y'all got quiet all of a sudden. Listen, that's one of the big differences between what we used to call revival, you know, and reviving, is that a revival has a beginning date and an end date. And nine times out of ten, <clears throat> if you go to church for three days of that revival, matter of fact, recently I was driving down to Mount Olive and I passed a church. And on the church sign, it says revival, Monday through Wednesday. Okay? Now, that's what we've all grown up going to. That's what we've all grown up doing. I understand that. But understand something. If we just leave what reviving is at a time and a place, we've missed it all. Because the tendency is to walk out the last night of revival and say, oh, well, that was good. I enjoyed being it. Now, back to life. Back to work. Back to just life as normal. And we leave everything that happened there because we're in the time frame of it. <clears throat> but a reviving work has no end date. It is continual. Let me show you what I mean. I want to show you that this is not just me. Listen to what the Scriptures say. I am sure of this, that he who started a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. And what that means is the day of Christ Jesus is the day Christ returns. The rapture, when Christ comes to take us home, to take us to heaven, <clears throat> and, and, and He takes all the believers out of the earth, uh, that's what it means that it is until the day of Christ Jesus. But go back to the rest of it. What did it say? He says, the writer says, I'm sure of this. The one who began it, the one who started a good work, will carry it on. That means he will continue to work on you, okay? He'll continue to be there (coughs) helping us when we fail, helping us when we fall, helping us when we blow it, helping us when we don't feel like doing anything, helping us when we just feel like, I don't want to do this thing anymore. Helping us when we don't feel like all is well with our soul. And you ready for this one? Because this is where most of us get. Helping us when we don't feel like saying all is well with our soul. Ever been there? I know God is good, and I know God hears me, and I know God wants to do things in me, but somehow, some way, I'm just in a real pouty mood, or I'm in a w- real woe is me mood. And I don't feel like saying that God is good. Y'all know what I'm, y'all going to get that? Ever been there? 
you bunch of liars. Only one amen. So that was only one who confessed it. The rest of you lie like a rug. Listen to this scripture. So the, the, the author writes, let us not get tired of doing good, for we will reap at the proper time if we, what's the last phrase? Don't give up. Continual. There's another one that I'm not going to read because I'd read the whole chapter. But mark it down if you're a note taker and read it in your personal time. Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12 really unpacks this. Uh, and it talks about that when you're tired and you get all tangled up in life, fix your eyes on Jesus. And it says, who is the author and the finisher of your faith. Meaning he's the one who gave it to you. He's the one who created your life. He's the one who began your life. He's the one who saved your life. He's the one who sustained your life. He's the one that's going to get you home. He began it. He'll see it through. So in your personal time, read Hebrews 12. These verses that I've shared reveal a continuation, a constant activity of reviving. Not just an occasional thing. Matter of fact, that's the role of the Holy Spirit. This is a whole other series one day. But the truth is, there is one Spirit who saves us through Christ, the Holy Spirit. But if you read the Scriptures, you understand there are unending refillings of that Spirit. <clears throat> he comes to you to refill you, to restore you, to replenish you, to, to reconcile you back to God. So there's one salvation, one baptism, but multiple <clears throat> refillings. Why? So that you don't get tired. So that you can persevere. <clears throat> well, let's just be honest. To be continual requires a strong level of commitment. <clears throat> Come on now. All it took for some people to quit coming to church was COVID. Boy, y'all got quiet. <clears throat> I'm not talking about people with legitimate health concerns. <clears throat> I'm talking about people who we've seen them everywhere else. Okay. But church is too much to come to. Okay? Let me just tell you something. That's twisted thinking. I don't care who you are. Get mad, glad, sad. You got all eternity to get over it. Okay? <clears throat> but it's the truth. All it takes for some of you to quit coming to church is for, is for me to walk down the aisle <clears throat> and not speak to you. Well, I ain't seen you in church in two months. Tracy's had this happen. I don't think here, but maybe in, in, her, in her former church life. <clears throat> Where Tracy would spend Sunday after church standing at the door or standing in the aisles helping poor pitiful victims who were mad that I looked at, at you when I'm walking down the aisle to go somewhere and didn't look at you. And I said, hey to you, just with a, and didn't say anything to you. And now they're pouty. Lord, you better help me get off this soapbox somehow. <clears throat> My wife, see, she won't amen me, but she just said, get off it. <laughs> All it takes is for some little perception, some little thing to happen, and it's the worst thing in the world you quit coming to church. But I don't understand why that same little thing can happen at work. Somebody could offend you at work. Somebody could do something to you driving down the road. Tracy and I were riding down the road the other day, and I pulled out, and I looked, and I saw that the car behind me uh, was a long way off. It was one of those butt-scratching cars, you know, the trucks that's dragging the ground, <clears throat> you know, one of them, you know, and it was dragging all the way to the ground now. I mean, he's like this, <laughs> looking out the window. You know, and, and the thing about it is, 
he bright lights me, and I didn't know why, because I didn't do anything wrong. And he whips around me, and he gave me the one finger salute. And I rolled my window down and said, Tracy, give it back to him. <laughs> and she did double barrel, I'm telling you. <laughs> you don't do that to my husband. I'm making it up in case you don't know. Tracy's looking at me like, they're going to believe you. Don't. Making it up. But I did think that would be pretty cool. <laughs> Here's what I'm getting at. Tracy's like, please do. Get back to it. For a continual work to be accomplished, it takes a continual level of strong commitment. And you can get, stump your toe, get your feelings hurt at work or in your hobby or at home. <clears throat> and you don't quit going home. I've never had a married couple come into the house, come, 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 come for counseling. I've had people come for counseling and say, well, we're not going to be coming to church anymore because you hurt our feelings. And I've never had anybody go in the house and say, come sit down and say, Pastor Mark, I'm not going home anymore. And the reason why I'm not going home is because they hurt my feelings. I'm not going to work anymore because they hurt my feelings. But for whatever reason, we feel like it's the greatest sin in the world. And we will break the commitment to God and church like that. And God wants us to know that He wants to do a reviving work in you and in me. But it takes a response, and it takes a strong level of commitment. And we all know that being consistently committed isn't always easy, especially if we only see our commitment as just another decision in our day. Now, I'm going to unpack that for a little while this morning because I think it's a dangerous slope that Christians live on. But let me start, start with, with that discussion with this quote. One of my favorite uh, writers <clears throat> that I read behind is Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, and he's a political and um, um, social and religious uh, uh, rabbi who talks all over the country and all over the world. And, and he made this, he said this quote a while back, a long time back, but he said, when it was hard to be a Jew, people stayed Jewish. But when it was easy to be a Jew, people stopped being Jewish. When it was hard to be a Jew, people stayed Jewish. <clears throat> but when it was easy to be a Jew, people stopped being Jewish. You see, let me just tell you something about the Jewish people. If you know any about your Old Testament and go study your Old Testament some, Jews were considered and are considered the chosen people of God. Why in the world the Christian church takes aim at Israel and the Jews in a negative way, I'll never understand it, but they're being fooled. You are supposed to pray as a Christian. You're supposed to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. You're supposed to support the Jewish people, the nation of Israel, God's chosen. And you see, here's the thing about Jewish people. From the day of the beginning, they understood that their destiny, and, and they understood their destiny, and they worked through all the circumstances to stay God's people. Okay? But unfortunately for us Christians, we're not a chosen people, especially in this country, we're a choosing people. What do you mean, Pastor? I mean, we just think that faith is, a, is just a simple decision. Doesn't call for a lot of commitment. Doesn't call for a lot of sacrifice. Doesn't call for a lot of surrender or sanctification. We choose to be a Christian like we choose to put on a cross necklace. And we just think that that's just a choice and we can take it off and we put it on. Jews went through the Holocaust. Jews went through hell and back. Jews are still going through hell and back. The Bible tells us in Revelation that the whole world is setting itself up against Israel to blow Israel off the map, not because there's some economic or political powerhouse, but because it's a demonic deal, effect of trying to wipe the presence of God off the map. 
And Revelation tells us that's coming. And Jews are going to be called through revival to Christ. Yes, Judaism doesn't accept, Orthodox Judaism doesn't accept Jesus as the Messiah. Why? They just see him as another man, sadly, like so many of us. You know how we know it? Because faith is just a simple decision, like getting your coffee. It's something you think you can do with or without. And here's why. Because we place our commitment on the act of choosing rather than placing our commitment on faith in Christ. Choosing to be a Christian today, choosing to love the Lord today, choosing to serve God today is like going to the Oreo aisle. Which brand do I want to choose this time? You see, that's one of the big things in America that we, think, we absolutely believe is our, is our God-given right, the right to choose. And the problem with that is choice is simply a casual process. It's just a casual thing. But commitment is not casual. Being in a committed relationship with Christ is a matter of identity, just like for the Jews. Yet Christians have difficulty taking this identity important because we treat the commitment of it like it's just any other decision in the day. Are y'all with me? Or have I made you mad yet? Well, I thought by now I'd have most of you walking out. But it's so true. Here's, here's how we treat commitment to Christ casually, okay? Instead of seeking to shape our lives and desires with God's truth, we want to shape reality according to our own desires. Come on. You remember, I, years ago, I, I told you this story, but it's one of these examples that I use when I try to explain this point. The point being that we would rather take bits and pieces of God's Word to justify the way we want to live or justify our choices rather than surrendering our choices to the truth of God. And here's the example that I've, I use a lot. Uh, years ago, I don't remember how long, I think it was probably the first, it might have been the first or second, I don't remember, time we took our girls to Disney World, we, we were in Disney World, and, and you know when you go to those places, they've got a, they've got a, a thing right there, a little measuring rod measuring stick, you know, and the kid's got to be this tall to get on the ride. Y'all know what I'm talking about? That kind of stuff. So <clears throat> we're walking past the Star Wars uh, exhibit. It was one of the times it had just opened or something like that, and it was just lines everywhere. And there was a dad standing there, and I, as I walked by, I could tell that ain't happening. Because if this was the measure, the kid was like right here. And I was like, that ain't going to happen. Because the kid was one of those that just looked like a tiny kid, you know. If he turned this way, you wouldn't see him. You know, it's just a little tiny kid. And he's about like that. And the dad walks up and, and says, stand up straight. Put your feet back. And I'm watching all of this, and the Disney guy goes, I'm so sorry, but he can't, he can't ride the ride. What do you mean he can't ride the ride? Come on, dude. He's almost there. I'm sorry, I, I can't do that. This is what the dad did. The dad reached down and grabbed him by the back of his shirt and stood him up on his tiptoes. Stand on your tiptoes. And, and stood him up on tiptoes. And the kid's just like, eh. you know, and holding him by his shirt. And, and it's like, and he said, see, he's there now. He's there now. And the guy said, no, nah, I'm sorry. And that guy proceeded to cuss that Disney employee out. And all he could do was stand there and smile. And I thought when I saw it, that's exactly how we do as Christians. If our lives don't measure up to God's Word, we want to change the rules of God's Word. God, bring your Word down to measure up where we want to be. Come on, church. That's some good preaching right there. I don't care if you're in this church or not. There's somebody in another church right now saying, I heard that. That was good preaching. We want to take God's Word and say, God, this is your standard 
but I don't meet that standard. And it's not that it's too high for me. It's that I don't want to change what you want to change in me. And so I want you to bring your standards down. That's how we treat faith as a casual choice. We're seeing it played out in our politics and in our news and in our culture today. Likes shape reality today, and therefore, likes becomes a reality, and the reality becomes the truth of the moment. Give it a few more days, and those likes will change, and the truth will change. Why? Because we want our truth to be important, little t, rather than the truth, capital T, to be the villain. It's happening all over. And I'm not talking about in the world. I'm talking about in the church. Twisting Scripture to make reality fit our desires rather than surrendering our desires to the mold of Scripture. Can I just say this to you? I heard that. Somebody said, you might as well. You've said everything else. I heard you when you thought it. Let me just say it this way to you. And we don't like this. Not in this country. We don't like this. Okay? Because we want our religion to be a matter of choice. And when we feel good about the Lord today, we'll come to church. When we feel good about uh, uh, the things that God's blessed us with, we'll give. When we feel good about something, we'll do. We want it to be about choice, not about commitment. So you're not going to like this because it takes the choice out of it in terms of degrees of choice. There's only one choice you can make in what I'm about to say. <clears throat> you ready? The Lordship of Christ must cover everything in our lives or mean nothing at all. The Lordship of Christ must mean everything to me or nothing to me. And Jesus says it that way. But Jesus says it in a very tart way. He's talking to the disciples and he says, unless a man hate his mother and father, his wife and children, now, you've got to go read the original language and understood the word hate there. He was being facetious. He was being sarcastic. What he was doing was using the word to show priority. He's saying all of these close relationships that we count on and we believe in so much, and they're good, he said, except a man hate these, he is not my disciple. You mean I've got to hate mom and daddy? No, that's not what he's saying. He's saying unless I am the priority above all other relationships, You're not my disciple. And do you know who he was talking to? His disciples. Not just the 12, but the others that were there. <clears throat> he was saying mama and daddy ought to be a, a, a high a relationship, a high priority relationship. Your kids ought to be a high priority relationship. Your spouse ought to be a high priority relationship. But none of them should be as high priority as I should be. And Jesus says it. He says, if any other relationship takes my seat, you're not my disciple. I think that takes choice out of it, doesn't it? I think he hits it pretty hard. Uh, let me show you another way he says it. <clears throat> in Luke, and this is my focus for today. Luke chapter 9, in Luke chapter 9, Jesus is talking, and he's talking to the disciples. And he, he, says, he says this, if anyone wants to follow after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life because of me will save it. For what does it benefit someone if he gains the whole world and yet loses or forfeits himself? Let's talk about this for a second. Here's how I want to break this down for you. <clears throat> what Jesus is teaching here is what we started this whole series or started this whole sermon today on, continual work. 
He said, there's going to be some continual work. And there's going to be days that you fail at that work. And there's going to be days that that work is tough. And there's going to be days that that work is hard. There's going to be days that you don't understand that work. When you're a parent sitting in a children's hospital with your four-year-old with cancer, you don't understand that work. When you're going through a hellacious divorce, when you've lost your job, when you're, you don't understand the work. And God says that's okay. We, live in, we have a finite amount of ability to know things, to understand things. Deuteronomy tells us that the secret things belong unto God, but those things which He has revealed are given to us and to our children and to their children forever. And what it really says is there are some answers you will never have. Come on. There are some things you will never understand. And Jesus is saying that, but that understand this, that it is a continual work. You haven't lost right here. It's a continual thing. So he gives you some things in that statement. Deny oneself, take up your cross daily, follow me. We're going to talk about those right here for a quick second. Because today's topic is about lordship. It's about who is master of your life. Who is leading you? That's what today is about. Because lordship is a continual process because our flesh likes to run its own race sometimes. So let me put it to you this way. Okay? Alterless Christianity, and that's altar with an A, you can see on the slide, underlined. So that's an altar. This is going to be an altar today. I didn't find one around here, but this is going to be an altar today. Okay? Alterless Christianity is Christianity that does not alter E, meaning change your life. What do you mean, Pastor? I mean, some things don't get altered with an E until they first get altered with an A. In the Bible, an altar is an instrument used to demonstrate surrender, sacrifice, and sanctifying. Okay? It's not a religious term that you use in traditional church. It's a term that is used in the Scriptures. It's an action that is done repeatedly in the Scriptures, particularly with the Old Testament. So in other words, let me say it like this. For something in my life to be altered with an E, that means change for the better, it has to be altered with an A. That means it has to be surrendered or sacrificed or sanctified. How do I do this, Pastor Mark? How do I get from one to the other? By doing this. If you're a note taker, write it down. If you're not, you ought to be a note taker. How do I alter with an E, make my life better, by altering with an A things in my life that need to be altered so that I'm changed? How do I move from good to better to best in my life? In God's plan. So here's how you do it. First of all, based on the three things Jesus told us, deny yourself, pick up your cross daily, and follow me. Okay? It's based on those. That, that right there is the format that we're talking about right here because I'm going to give you multiples of three here. Okay? First of all, I have to identify what needs to be given up, surrendered. What needs to be surrendered? What needs to be given up? Here's a question you can throw at yourself to help you, to help you determine this. In other words, what hurt, what habit, what hang-up do I need to let go of? You see, you cannot make a get or, or, or grow into a better person if you're holding on to unforgiveness, to bitterness, to resentment, to prejudice, to hatred. You can't 
get better, so to speak, if it's not been put on the altar. And it has to be surrendered. Nobody can take it from you. They can do an x-ray and say, oh, you know, there's a spot here or there's an ulcer here, and they can go in and fix that. But they can't do an x-ray of you and go, oh, yep, there's hatred right here. There's racism right there. There's unforgiveness right there. We know what we got to go in and surgically remove. Nobody can go in and take it. It has to be, here you go. It has to be surrendered. And here's the thing about the wily old devil. When you go to surrender, he goes, oh, no, you just keep that. You're good. God will still love you. You just hold on to that. You just hold on to that. And he does it right here. God, I'm giving it to you. And then three days later, the devil says, let's just see how much you've given to him. And he brings up the situation, right? He brings it up in your mind, and it explodes like a bomb. And it just, you know the things that they do all these gender reveals with, and the color, and all this kind of stuff, you know, all that kind of stuff people do. Anyway, you know how it just goes everywhere. It just covers everything. That's what happens in your mind. And the devil goes, apparently you didn't surrender it, or apparently God didn't take it like you wanted him to. Hello, what are we talking about? A continual reviving work means God's still working it out of you. It's been in you for years. How do you expect it to go out in moments? We have cultivated, there's a couple of stories in the Bible. Cain did it to his brother. Uh, Jacob uh, and Esau went this way. And there's a couple of phrases in the Bible that says this, and he consoled himself with the thought of killing his brother. There's another phrase I like in there because this is what we do. It says, and he was so envious that he nursed the wound. He didn't try to make it better. He kept picking at it to keep it bad so he could remember the pain, so he could deal with it in a place of anger. Come on, church. And the devil says, oh, apparently you didn't surrender it. There are some hurts in your life. There are some habits that you can't kick. There are some hang-ups that keep coming back on you that you've got to surrender. And don't worry if you surrender it today and it comes back tomorrow, it's been in your flesh for years. God's going to help get that out of you. But let me move on. So I've got to identify what I need to give up, what I need to surrender for things to be altered with an E, my life to grow, grow in a better position. But I also need to identify what needs to be burned up. Oh, excuse me, what needs to die. I need to identify what needs to die? In other words, what needs to be sacrificed? Here's a question. What in my life stands in the way of me selling out to Jesus? So when he says, deny yourself, surrender, surrender those lusts, surrender those spirits, surrender those envies, surrender those hurts, surrender those hang-ups, you got to give them up. Nobody's going to take them. And then he says, <clears throat> but then after you deny yourself, take up your cross daily. What is the cross represented? The sacrifice of Jesus. So he says, so there are things you're going to have to die to. There are things you're going to have to figure out what needs to die in your life. And only you and Christ can figure those things out. Only you guys. And then thirdly, you're going to have to identify what needs to be burned up, sanctified. Sanctification is the process of the Holy Spirit burning up fleshly things in us that we keep wanting to keep around. So if you're a person who, who has issues with anger, you, you may be a person that God has to continually work you through the process of becoming a more docile person and dealing with problems, right? 
if you're a person who, who deals with other, I mean, they're just things that God's Spirit gives you the power because your flesh doesn't have the power. This isn't about self-will. God gives you His Spirit to begin sanctifying you. Sanctification is about transferring and transforming the mindset of how you think. That's an ongoing process, right? Y'all getting this? But sanctifying means this. It means the setting apart. In the Old Testament, everything God did like that with His people was He wanted to set them apart from the world so that they could be a, a bright light of His love to the world. That's what He wanted them to be. And so it sets it apart. These are areas I have to allow the Holy Spirit to spiritually burn away in my life. So here's the question. What area of my life, what areas of my life are a battle that I cannot win in my own flesh and strength and I need the Holy Spirit to be my strength? We all have those areas whether it's depression or whether it's, it's whatever, lying, stealing, whatever it may be. It don't matter. There are things that are connected that we can't change of our own uh, power and flesh. It has to come from trusting in the Holy Spirit and letting Him do it. You know, some of our areas are head issues, and that can be fixed by knowledge, right? If I have an issue with changing the oil in my car, if I learn how to change the oil, now I have the head knowledge, I know how to fix it, right? So some of our issues are head knowledge or head issues. It just takes some knowledge to fix it. But some of our issues are heart issues. And these can't be fixed or changed in us until the one who holds my heart is allowed to shape it into his heart. And that's sanctifying. Because he shapes my heart continually. Why? Because sin also shapes your heart. And not for your own good. Guys, gals, ladies, gentlemen, brothers and sisters, whether you're in this place today and you're a Christian or not, please hear me. There are things that God wants to do in us, but we have to make room first. It's the continual work. There are things that we want God to do in our hearts and lives, but He can't until we make room. Understand something. God's will for your life and mine is so good and is so perfect that He doesn't compete with my will. He's like, dude! <laughs> I love to know that God says, dude. Wouldn't you? But it's like God says, dude! What you've got in your life right now is good! And what I've got for you is better! And you're trying to convince me to change your life by letting you keep what's only good when what I've got is perfect and best. And you're wanting me to give that up and just bless your good. How many of you have ever had this said to you or you've ever said it? I only want what's best for you. And you're unwilling to settle for anything else than the best. Well, that's God's will. God's will is so good and perfect, He won't compete with your will. Because, you know, the truth is this. Our heart is like a chair. Now, <clears throat> when Kristen was a little girl, Taylor would do this too, but not as much as Kristen would do. 
Taylor was her own boss, she said. Okay? But when Kristen was a little girl, a little tiny little girl, it didn't matter where we were. If we were at Grandma Doris's for Christmas, we were at John and Marty's, we were at my mom and dad's, wherever we were, <clears throat> when she got tired of playing or whatever, she'd come to me and she'd crawl up in my lap and just sit here. Can I just tell you, and I know you dads, especially if you've got dads of, of, of little girls, they ain't nothing better. You'll blow up the whole world for that kid, won't you? Little boy too, but mamas tend to feel that way about them little boys. And she'd come crawl up in my lap. Now, I would become a chair for her, okay? But a chair's not made for two people. It's made for one. Here's our problem. We want God's will to be a couch. Come here, Kristen. <clears throat> she won't even sit close to me now. Can y'all see that? <laughs> I can't get her to sit close to me. Slide over. We got to make room. Come here, Spencer. Sit right there. <clears throat> sit right there. Now, while we're here, we need to talk about you dating my daughter. <laughs> Son, you and I got to have a talk. This is what we want from God. We want God to let us keep things in our lives, and we want Him to just share Himself with us. Come on, church. I know y'all feel awkward. You can go back to your seats now. I can hear a heartbeat. But this is what we want with God. We want God's will to be a couch that we can share with Him, but we keep control. And if we need Him to get up and move, and we can have, have somebody else sit here. We want God's will to be a couch. And we want Him to change our life for the better. We want Him to alter with an E our life for our good. But only if He's sharing His will with us and, and letting us keep ours. But here's what God says. The only way I alter your life is if you put your life on the altar. And you lay it out before me. If you will let me alter with an A your life, giving that up, and surrender your life to me, and let me sit on the throne of your heart, because you know that's what your heart is. Your heart is not a couch, your heart is a throne. Your heart can only have one king. And we constantly want God to make our heart a couch. Oh, church. When the Lord speaks to you, when He gives you something, that he wants to do in your life it may not be for today <clears throat> see that's some of our problem when we're sitting on the couch and God tells us how he wants to change our life and how he may even change our circumstance he may even change our position he may even change our job he may even change our location of where we are he may even, I mean Tracy and I left 11 years ago to whatever it was uh, to come here okay but God, can't you do what you want to do with me here? No, 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 no. Can't do that. But Mark, understand something. <clears throat> God gave me a word by a lady who, was a, who's, who were, operates in the gifts of prophecy. And I'd have never met her. If she walks in the door right now, I would never meet her. I've never met her. I would never know who she was. God woke her up at 3 a.m. one morning and began to write a letter to me, a man she never met in 2010. 
and gave it to a, a, a person who, who worked with her and knew me because he had been to my church uh, for years and I was his pastor. And so she gave him a letter in 2010 and he gave it to me and I said, thanks, that's nice. But God and I have already got our own plan. Did you hear that? God and I already got our own plan. And by the end of 2010, we were feeling the restlessness. And in 2011, God began to make a move in our lives. Right? But guess what that was? That wasn't just about coming to this church. That wasn't just about God moving us in a different location for Him to use us to minister. That's not all that was about. That was about God saying to her and to me, <clears throat> are you willing to surrender more of your life for more of my will? Because if you are, Tracy didn't have to give up a couch. <laughs> we had just built a house three or four years earlier, and it was our dream house. We didn't have to give up a couch. We had to give up a house. But what is a house when God owns the mansions on the hillside? When God's blessings are ever continual, when God's work is ever continual? You see, what I'm getting at is sometimes God will give you a word like He did us in 2010 that's not for that day. It's for days later. But the only way that word comes to pass in your life is if you have surrendered your life. He will keep His promises, but only as we deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow Him. Stand with me. I'm going to say this to everybody in this room. <coughs> And I'm asking the Holy Spirit to burn it into you like a tattoo, okay? Internally, in your brain, in your spirit, I don't care if you're one year old or I don't care if you're 101 years old, <clears throat> what I'm about to say to you is the pinnacle of this whole message. And I don't, if you're a note taker, great, write it down. But I'm hoping that the Holy Spirit will not let you go from this because this is about that in 2021 and here it simply is there is something in your future that is predicated on your obedience on your action now I believe it with all my heart there is something God's going to do in you or for you or through you one day out there but it is predicated, meaning it won't come alive to you. It won't be made real to you. It won't be revealed to you until you start today in obedience. And for some of you, that means giving up your couch in your heart and putting a chair back. Some of you, that means surrendering some old wounds. Some of you, that means putting to death some things in your life now that you live by, that you know are not good for you, that you know are not getting you closer to God. It's just giving you a fake sense of security that you're all right. And all of us need to let the sanctifying power of God's Spirit burn off things in us. For God to do a reviving work, it requires a response. And that response and that work are both continual from now to the end of your life. And for you to make it to that day, there has to be one throne in your heart, and His Lordship has to mean everything or nothing. Bow your heads. You're in this place. And you know you've got a couch as the throne of your heart. 
you bargain with God, you try to work with God to do things your way, you want a pound of flesh rather than forgiveness for those old hurts or wounds or you're scared to trust Him with your life because you've got things you want to accomplish in life and it's just hard to, for you to see beyond what you have. If you're here today and you need to surrender something, if you're here today and you need to sacrifice something, if you're here today and you need the sanctifying power of God's Spirit to begin battling better and stronger in your life, any one of those three things, put your hand up. Put your hand up all over this place. Put your hands up all over this place. 14, 15, all over this place. Oh, don't be prideful. You see, you're not putting your hand up for me to recognize you. You're putting your hand up to say, I surrender it, God. Right now, I surrender it. Right now, Holy Spirit, sanctify me. Come into my mind and my spirit. Come into my heart and begin to bleed out of me the things that just simply bring shame and guilt and hurt to my life that hold me in bondage, that hold me uh, in, in all kinds of demoralizing and, 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 and prison-type ways in my spirit life. Oh, God, move right now in this place. Move right now in this place. Oh, what a Savior. Yes. Oh, Holy He's in Do a work right now. Help somebody in this room surrender Sing something. God, would you hear them say, God, I surrender this. Christ is Holy Spirit, risen. when they give it to you, will you take it? Will you replace in them a sense of wholeness, a sense of healing, a sense of peace? Right now, when they say, I surrender it, Holy Spirit, release your peace, I pray. Show them they're okay. Sing hallelujah. God, when somebody in this place says, God, I need this to die in my Christ life. Is risen. And they name it to you, Holy Spirit, what it is, where you begin to kill that thing in them, that lying spirit, that lustful oh, spirit. Whatever me. spirit is there, God, whatever is trying to rule their life in a negative way, in a sinful way, would you begin to kill that in their lives right now? Release Give your life and freedom in them. Was bought with the precious blood of oh, Jesus Christ. Holy Christ. Spirit, in my life right now, in the lives of everybody in this room, we need your sanctifying power. Oh, Holy Spirit, we need your sanctifying power from one wall to the next. Come to we need to know when the Jesus says, and follow me, that means let me fill your life. Let me lead your life. Let me purify your life. Let me become your heart's king. Oh, Holy Spirit. You can sanctify people right now where they stand. And in the name of Christ, we're praying together. Holy Spirit, have your way and do your work. Hallelujah, hallelujah. In this place today, in these hearts today, remove couches and replace them with altars and replace them with a throne. Throughout this place today, oh, Holy Spirit, do that work right now. God, of people feeling something from the head to the top of their head to the soles of their feet, and they're sensing something and they're feeling something, show them who you are. You may be here today and you just feel like you've got to come to this altar, then you come to this altar. Don't walk, don't wait, run to the altar. If you feel like that's what you need to do to spend some time alone, then this altar is open. Find you a place and get there. Oh, Holy Spirit. Oh, Holy Spirit. Break bondages, break wounds, break scars, God, the people that the enemy is holding us captive to. 
Jesus. Fill us with your water that we'll never thirst again. Ignite in every young person in this room your spirit. Ignite life in them that they sense you're real and you love them and you're there for them. And it's just a walk of faith that you'll give them. Ignite the word in our lives today. Stir a craving and a hunger. Fan the flames of your spirit and fill us by your spirit, I pray. Oh, hallelujah. We praise you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. Don't let us leave this building without you. Without the evidence of your work in us that you're doing right now. Don't let us leave without knowing you deeper and better and stronger. Don't let us leave this building without a fresh fire of your presence stirring, awakening our lives in surrender to you, in service to you. Sanctify us, I pray name of Jesus. Amen. I'm going to let you go, but I got one quick announcement. And it's good. Don't freak anybody out. I've had people ask me, the 21 days of prayer and fasting is up today. So you can go back to your, however many days you fasted. You might have just fasted three days or 21 all, or whatever you did. But our 21 days of prayer and fasting is up. <clears throat> and Wednesday night, a week ago, last Wednesday night, the Lord gave us a word that this wasn't about filling us with something, something new. This was about striking a match, igniting something in people's lives. And I've had people ask me, I wish we weren't going to end the 21 days and the prayer nights and things like that. And I've not felt that leading to continue that every single night that we've been doing that. But God has given me a different direction. And so I want to announce it today. And I want you to really work to be a part of it. <clears throat> this is what I felt the leading of the Lord to do. So the first Sunday of March, the first Sunday of March, Sunday evening, 6.30, I'm asking everyone from sixth grade to age 30 to meet me here in the sanctuary. I want to talk with you about how important you are to this church. And I want to talk with you about your prayer life. I'm not going to preach at you. I'm not going to keep you forever. And then we're going to have a time of prayer. Everyone in this room. Now, if you're 30 and your spouse is 31, yeah, they can come. Okay? We, can do, we deal with that. Parents, do everything you can. March the 7th, 630, 6th grade through 30 years of age. If you know of some of our folks that ain't here today and they fit that age, you young people, I don't see Dalton. You tell Dalton to be here. Tell him to be here. Okay? Anybody who you see in that age, and you know them. March 14, 630. Everybody who's 30 to 60 years of age. If you're 30 to 60, I want you to be here that night. 21st, if you're 60 plus, I'll let you fill in the plus. You're 60 plus, that's your night. Be here. We're going to have a time of prayer because here's what I felt God doing. Mark, this is a generational thing. I'm not just a God of the individual, I'm a God of generations. And I want you to focus on every generation in a time of prayer with themselves and for themselves. So I don't know what we'll do after that, but that's the continuation. Won't be in here every night like we have been, but three Sunday nights, 6.30, do everything you can to put it on your calendar to be here. Do I know what we're going to do after that? No. Do I know what God's going to do? No. I just know 
to come expectant out of obedience. Remember the word? He gives you a word today. It comes to pass somewhere down the future predicated on your obedience now. Prayerfully consider that. Prayerfully do everything you can to be at that. Thank you for your time. Thank you for being here. You're dismissed. Have a wonderful, wonderful day and a safe week. Love you all.